In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you why curved greatswords are the best weapon in Elden Ring. This is our 14th video showcasing all the weapons within a certain weapon group, showcasing their strengths and weaknesses so that you can decide if they should be a part of your build or not. Before I get into that, however, first let's take a look at the pros and cons of this weapon group itself, as well as the styles of play that I think most people will use while playing one of these weapons. Taking a look at the pros first, curved swords have a decent amount of reach compared to other weapon types, and they attack a bit faster than some of the other heavy weapon groups. Additionally, three of the nine curved greatswords will be able to set status effects natively, and five of the nine have unique weapon skills that are available only to them. Some of the cons of this weapon group are that their block counters hit in a shorter distance than a lot of other weapon types, and that many of the best ones in this weapon group are not found until very late into the game. When it comes to the playstyles I think most people will use when using curved greatswords, I think they'll either two-hand a single great curved sword in order to lean into its weapon skill and get fast attacks with R1, or they'll dual wield curved greatswords in order to use jump attacks, or probably falling back on one of the weapon skills. I don't think you're going to see too many hybrid builds with this weapon group, meaning you're not going to see like a strength faith build very frequently, or a strength intelligence or dexterity faith, dexterity intelligence. There just aren't too many weapons that lend themselves well to that in my opinion, unless you're doing something like the Hellfire Herald build, but you're using two infusible curved greatswords. Otherwise, probably going to stick with, you know, strength dexterity for most of these weapons, or the stats that they scale natively with leaning into their weapon skill, but you probably won't add too many spells unless they're just buffs to that. Those things being said, let's jump into the unique curved greatswords first, beginning with Bloodhound's Fang. The Bloodhound's Fang shares the default attack of most curved greatswords and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a curved sword in Elden Ring Wing 11.5, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Bloodhound's Fang is an absolute banger of a curved greatsword. It's one of two curved greatswords with native bleed build up on hit, it has increased jump attack damage, it's the third longest curved greatsword, it can still be buffed with magic or grease, and you can acquire it within the first 10 minutes of the game by defeating Bloodhound Knight Darewell. There are almost no negatives to this weapon. Bloodhound's Finesse is a great weapon skill as well, providing you a means to quickly get away from a difficult enemy or boss and then darting back in if you want to follow up with another slash. Both of these animations have some iframes associated with them, so you can learn the timing to outright negate damage while you deal it. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 45 strength and 55 dexterity, though the weapon has phenomenal scaling for dexterity all the way up to 80, and strength is not bad either. Which you prioritize after this point though depends on whether or not you're two-handing the weapon or single-handing it, strength being the better option if you're two-handing. Because the weapon scales so well up to 80 in both of these stats, the weapon will still perform well in NG+, and NG++. I strongly recommend making a build with this weapon, like my Bloodhound build, that leans into the weapon skill as well as jump attacks, which are two of the three strongest aspects of the weapon. Don't prioritize bleed, as it's not something you will trigger often due to the high damage of the weapon itself, but do remember to use grease in boss fights for increased damage or bleed buildup when needed. The Raptor's Black Feathers work well here, further boosting your jump attack damage, as does the Claw Talisman. I'd also include Warrior Jar Shard or Shard of Alexander to boost Bloodhound's finesse damage, and the Green Turtle Talisman and or the Green Turtle Shield, even if it's just on your back, to boost stamina recovery because Bloodhound's Finesse is a stamina monster. Up next is the Onyx Lord's Greatsword. The Onyx Lord's Greatsword shares the default attack of most curved greatswords and deals physical and magic damage. It has an average weight for a curved greatsword in Elden Ring Wing 11.5 and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and some intelligence in order to use. The Onyx Lord's Greatsword is an interesting curved sword because it has relatively good damage, of which some is magic, making it the only curved greatsword with native intelligence scaling. It's got an average reach, and it deals increased damage to gravity-based enemies like Alabaster Lords. However, you cannot find it until further on in the game in the Sealed Tunnel in the capital outskirts. Its weapon skill, Onyx Lord's Repulsion, knocks enemies backward, off and off their feet, and the sword itself does additional damage if you can strike an enemy with it when using this weapon skill. The AoE does 100% magic damage, which is a touch problematic as the sword itself scales much better with strength and intelligence, despite both having B scaling and max upgrade. Still, it hits many enemies at once at medium range, and it hits them for relatively good damage as well. It can also strike through objects, allowing you to stay out of harm's way. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 strength and 30 intelligence, with minimum points invested into dexterity. Strength outscales intelligence from this point onward up to about 80, but intelligence does well until 50, where it will drop off sharply. However, because Onyx Lord's Propulsion scales with intelligence only and not strength, I recommend prioritizing intelligence to about 40 or so once you have enough strength to build the weapon. This will allow you to get the most from this weapon's skill while only sacrificing a small amount of melee damage to do it. Build-wise, I suggest two-handing this weapon, taking advantage of its solid strength scaling and leaning into its weapon skill when needed. 
Block counters are not particularly effective with this weapon as it has short range, so I don't recommend using a shield with this weapon. Use Shard of Alexander or Warrior Jar Shard and Magic Scorpion Charm for increased repulsion damage, and make sure to use Carrion Filigreed Crest and the Sacrificial Axe in your offhand to help with FP management. Make sure you have over 51 poise so that you can tank through some hits while using this weapon's skill as it has a long windup. Up next we have the Zamor Curve Sword. The Zamor Curve Sword has a unique R1 chain that spins the character between each strike, and it increases its damage multiplier even more so than other curved greatswords, and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a curved greatsword in Elden Ring Wang 9, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Zamor Curved Sword is a bit of a strange weapon because it has very low attack rating and is the shortest curved greatsword in Elden Ring. However, it is one of the lightest curved greatswords, and it's the only one that does frostbite buildup natively, and it does more damage per R1 hit after the first strike than other curved greatswords, maxing out at 1.2 times the damage on the fourth swing versus the 1.1 times the damage of other curved greatswords on the fourth swing. This last bit, though, is less important since the lower base damage means you'll essentially come out the same as other curved greatswords damage-wise, but only if you complete your R1 chain. This also makes it a good candidate for the Twin Blade Talisman that boosts the damage of your final R1 chain swing. It's just too bad you cannot acquire it until near the end of the game in Giant Conquering Heroes Great. Where this weapon really shines, though, is its weapon skills the more Ice Storm. It operates in a similar manner to Onyx Lord's Repulsion, only it doesn't knock enemies away or down, does Frostbite build up with each hit, and hits repeatedly instead of in one blast. Note that these repeated hits only count as one combined attack, so it does not trigger talismans like Rotten Winged Sword, Insignia, etc., even if it hits multiple enemies. Like Onyx Lord's Repulsion, it also deals 100% magic damage, which is strange considering the weapon deals no magic damage, and neither strength nor dexterity boosts the damage of this weapon's skill. Warrior Jar Shard or Shard of Alexander, Magic Scorpion Charm, and Magic Shrouded Crack Tier all boost the damage of this skill significantly, and it deals about twice the damage of Onyx Lord's Repulsion with each cast, costing 12 FP less, and as I mentioned, inflicts Frostbite buildup with each hit. Note that its attack power and Frostbite status buildup has been increased, its casting speed has been increased, and its recovery time has been shortened as of patch 1.07. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 45 strength and 55 dexterity, though the weapon scales okay up to 80 with both of these stats, making it an okay choice for NG+. However, since there is no way to increase the damage of Zamora Ice Storm via scaling, you'll have a hard time on a third playthrough as it takes more and more casts to wipe out your enemies. I recommend two-handing this weapon and leading into its weapon skill, spamming it as much as needed to set Frostbite on top enemies and to wipe out groups when outnumbered. Or using it in a dual wield setup with something like Bloodhound's Fang for bleed build as well, using either weapon skill depending on the boss you are facing. Next we have Magma Worm's Scale Sword. The Magma Worm Scale Sword shares a unique R2 attack with the Omen Cleaver and deals physical and fire damage. It has a very heavy weight for a curved greatsword in Elden Ring Wang 15, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. Magma Worm Scale Sword has incredibly high attack rating for a curved greatsword and can be acquired not terribly far into the game if you know where to go in the rune strewn precipice, especially compared to some other curved greatswords. It is extremely heavy though, and it's in the bottom half of curved greatswords when it comes to length, but its weapon skill Magma Guillotine more than makes up for it. Magma Guillotine can often one or two shot bosses with its initial attack and follow up and it's damn near impossible to interrupt once it's far enough into its animation, making it one of the deadliest weapon skills in Elden Ring. Once you use this weapon skill, it's pretty much easy mode from there on out. This weapon skill does use a ton of stamina though, making it hard to use it back to back unless you've got good endurance or the right gear, so plan accordingly. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 55 strength and 50 faith with minimum points in dexterity, but it scales rather well up to 80 strength and 50 dexterity, as well making it a weapon that performs well in New Game Plus and beyond. I recommend making something like my Drake Knight build with this weapon, leaning into its weapon skill as it's really the best thing about this weapon. Use Flame Grant Me Strength and Golden Vow to buff before boss fights for increased damage, and use Shard of Alexandra or Warrior Jar Shard and Fire Scorpion Charm to further boost your Magma Guillotine damage. And then we come to the last unique Curved Great Sword, Margot's Curse Sword. Margot's Curse Sword shares the default attack of most Curved Great Swords and deals physical damage. It is the lightest curved greatsword in Elden Ring Wing 7.5 and requires some points in strength and arcane and a lot of points in dexterity in order to use. While Margot's Curse Sword has markedly lower attack rating than most other curved greatswords, it has a lot going for it. It's the lightest and longest curved greatsword, it has native bleed buildup on it that does improve with arcane scaling, and it has the highest critical multiplier of all curved greatswords at 110. Unfortunately, it cannot be acquired until after you beat Margot, which is approaching the end of the game-ish. Cursed Blood Slice, its weapon skill, actually adds fire damage to its attacks, and the Trailing Slice deals 100% fire damage, so you can get some fire damage out of this weapon. 
This makes Flame Grant Me Strength a really great buff for this weapon skill since it will buff all aspects of its damage. Cursed Blood Slice also deals fantastic damage if you land the whole combo, which can sometimes be difficult to do on bosses unless you have good poise. However, it's quite expensive at 20 FP and 20 more for the follow-up, meaning you cannot use it regularly without planning for it. I recommend using the Carrion Filigreed Crest if you use this, since it'll reduce the FP cost of the initial attack and follow-up by a total of 10 FP, which is nothing to sneeze at. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 Dexterity and 50 Arcane, with Dexterity outperforming Arcane in terms of damage, but Arcane adding bleed buildup. Which you prioritize really depends on whether or not you plan to use the Dragon Communion Seal or to cast some incantations. If you do plan on using it, you might want to prioritize Arcane after meeting the initial Dexterity requirements. If not, focusing on Dexterity for more damage should probably be the play here. Because of the native Arcane scaling, Morgoth's Curse Sword makes a great candidate for Dragon Communion Seal pairing and a small assortment of incantations like Flame Grammy Strength, Golden Vow, and either Madness and Blood spells like I did in my Mad King build or Dragon spells, since these have lower faith requirements. However, you could just as easily play this with only the weapon maxing its weapon damage. If you plan to go the hybrid route, focus on Arcane meeting the minimum Dexterity requirement of 35 and add enough faith to cast the incantations you want. Add things like the Fire Scorpion Charm and Ritual Sword Talisman, which boost the damage of Fire Incantations and Cursed Blood Slice, as well as your overall damage at full health. Note that the Roar Medallion now affects Dragon Spells, so make sure you slot it if you use those. If you plan to go pure melee, you'll want Shard of Alexander or Warrior Jar Shard, Carrion Filigreed Crest, and possibly even Ancestral Spirit Horn and Sacrificial Axe to increase your Cursed Blood Slice damage while also reducing its cost and providing a means to get FP back with kills. Make sure you have good mind with this setup as well. So that wraps up our unique curved great swords, which brings us to our infusible ones, beginning with Dismounter. The Dismounter shares the default attack of most curved great swords and deals physical damage. Has an average weight for a curved sword and Elden Ring weighing 10, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Dismounter is the second longest curved great sword. It has decent attack rating. It's rather light at 10 weight and can be found very early on in Elden Ring by farming the Caden warriors who wield it. However, it is outperformed damage-wise by the Omen Cleaver, which isn't much harder to acquire, making the choice between these weapons really between the length of the weapon, the weight of the weapon with the Omen Cleaver being 2.5 heavier, and the different R2 attacks, as they both have the same exact strength and dexterity requirements. However, unlike the Omen Cleaver, Magic is the leading damage infusion here, followed by Sacred and Flame Art, and then Fire and Lighting just behind that. Keen actually outperforms Heavy, so you might want to consider this option if you plan to one-hand the weapon with the shield. I don't recommend Magic or Sacred and Flame Art, even though they have the highest damage, since you need to invest several points into Strength and Dexterity to use this weapon, which won't leave you with as many points for Faith or Intelligence early on. If you decide to use this over the Omen Cleaver, either lean into a strong Ash of War or one-hand it with a shield. I'm not a fan of block counters with curved greatswords, but this one is one of the longest, and it makes the best case for it if you insist on a block counter focus build with a curved greatsword. Next we have the Omen Cleaver. The Omen Cleaver shares a unique R2 attack with the Magma Worm Scale Sword and deals physical damage. Has an average weight for a curved greatsword in Elden Ring, weighing 11.5, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Omen Cleaver is the king of early game curved greatswords since it's longer than most curved greatswords, has higher attack rating than all but the Beastman's Cleaver, and can be farmed in Stormvale Castle from the Omen enemy there rather easily. If you like curved greatswords but don't know where to begin, this is a great option as it will be hard to beat later on unless you want a specific weapon skill. The R2 attack of this weapon has very short range, but it can be executed extremely quickly, allowing you to spam it at point-blank range easily. Fire and Lightning come in first place for damage, then Magic with Sacred and Flame Art just behind that. Heavy and Keen are after these, with Cold just behind those. The relatively low requirements for this weapon and its average weight make it possible to play this two-handed or two dual wield a pair of them, utilizing jump attacks. I strongly suggest using the Heavy or Cold infusions if you're not going for Fire or Lightning and two-handing this weapon with a strong Ash of War like Sword Dance. It often one-shots most enemies on the first hit, and if not, the second hit surely does, meaning you rarely need to use the follow-up attack. Next is the Monk's Flame Blade. The Monk's Flame Blade shares the default attack of most curved greatswords and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for curved greatsword and Elden Ring wing 9, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Monk's Flame Blade has the lowest attack rating of all infusible curved greatswords. It's the third shortest curved greatsword, and you cannot find it until near the end of the game in Giant Conquering Hero's Grave by farming the Fire Monks there, which can take a while. This makes the only real reason to use this weapon is because of its cosmetic appearance, which is, in my opinion, one of the best in the game. Fire and Lightning takes the top spot for damage, followed by Magic with Flame Art and Sacred being a close third. Keen outperforms Heavy with Cold being just behind them. Consider using this weapon with a cold infusion and a dual wield setup with something like the Bloodhound's Fang in order to rip off huge chunks of health between Frostbite and Hemorrhage, 
though you likely will already have a suitable replacement with Dismounter much earlier on in the game. And this brings us to our last curved grade sword, the Beastman's Cleaver. The Beastman's Cleaver shares the default attack of most curved grade swords and deals physical damage. It is the heaviest curved grade sword in Elden Ring wing 16.5 and requires a lot of points in strength and in summon dexterity in order to use. The Beastman's Curved Sword is the king of curved grade swords when it comes to damage and it has exceptional guard boost as well, making it great for blocking and block counters while two-handing it. You can also get one relatively early on in the game by taking the lowest way gate on the hill of the four Belthrys and Lurany of the Lakes. However, it is also the heaviest curved grey sword and has the second shortest reach, so you'll have to consider these things as well. Fire and Lightning take the top spot here with Magicka Distance second and Sacred and Flame Art coming in third. Heavy is miles ahead of Keen in terms of damage, which is also coincidentally outperformed by Cold as well, making it a decent option. Because this is primarily a strength-based weapon and one that blocks well two-handed, I suggest using it in this manner particularly because it's so heavy, and using jump attacks, R2s, block counters, and a solid Ash of War like Wild Strikes or Sword Dance to take out enemies in any manner that is fitting. If you don't like the length of the weapon or it's too heavy, Ullman Cleaver is a solid second option. So that wraps up our Curved Greatswords video. I hope you guys learned something. If you have any more questions, please leave them in the comments, or if I miss something, leave them there for other players so that they can get that information. Let me know in the comments what uh, weapon group you guys want me to do next, since I'm not sure which one to go at. And I think also we are going to have another build guide on Friday, so stay tuned for that.